All right, I'm Steve Piku, and I am glad to be here today. This has been a, a, a labor of love for the past four years to get to work on this project. It means a lot to us. It means a lot to New Orleans. It means a lot to Louisiana. We're going to kick things off with an interesting look. Um, back in 2011, uh, New Orleanian Lisa Jackson participated in a press conference up in Cincinnati where the EPA launched the Water Technology Innovation Cluster Initiative. And it's, uh, it's been a catalyst for people in communities and regions around the country to try and aggregate their water assets into some kind of manageable entity, something that can be branded, something that can be coordinated. And what we're going to do today is uh, meet a couple of people who are working on, on, on water clusters and working on developing water assets on a, on a rather grand scale. And we're going to try and learn some lessons from them, see if we can apply them to, to our region. Uh, Dean Amhouse is going to be the first pe person we hear from today. Dean is coming here from Milwaukee, and thank you, Dean, for, for taking the trouble. You do want to go first, don't you? <laughs> Uh, he's with the Water Council and the Global Water Center in Milwaukee, where business, civic, and academic leaders join together to build upon their historic water assets to collaboratively support innovation that will spark new businesses and resources to address not just their own issues, but global water issues, and try and keep their region thriving as well. Uh, he's here to share some of their plans and hopefully some of their strategies so that we can follow as we try to coalesce and build Louisiana's water cluster. Uh, Dean has a long history of public service and economic development. He's a visionary. He's a great guy. When we met a lot of the people that work for him and saw how cool some of them were, we were like, this guy must be cool. So we are really grateful to have Dean Amhaus here with the Global Water Center in Milwaukee. Good morning, everybody. And uh, as Steve says, what cool Coming from Milwaukee, when I looked this morning, it was 15 degrees. Uh, it's wonderful to be down here. I finally remember what spring is like. Um, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this program. I'm just going to go through a little bit of what we're doing in Milwaukee. And I want to emphasize is that uh, a lot of times people misdiagnose what we are as the Water Council. We are actually an economic development organization that is focused on water, and more specifically, water technology. Uh, we are not an environmental organization. We have a strong interest in the environment and water, but true, truly, we are about developing our economy around water. And in fact, uh, and this picture will show you, our roots go back to water. The Native Americans moved to the Milwaukee area, uh, or located there, and in fact, the name Milwaukee means gathering place by the waters. And so after the Native Americans came, the French came, and then the Germans came. And when the Germans came, they brought brewing lots and lots of beer. And we became you know, the brewing capital of the United States and certainly across the world. Uh, that industry had suppliers. Goes back over 100 years. These were the companies that were making the pumps, the meters, the valves, the fixtures. They were all supplying these big, large water users all of their different equipment. And over a period of years, pollution, putting things into the river, into the lakes, and that all changed 40 years ago when the Clean Water Act came into play. And so this industry had to modify and adapt, and more importantly, the suppliers of those industries had to change their practices. And so we grew new businesses that were addressing uh, water quality as well as quantity, and then addressing the water issues that were in our rivers and lakes. And that grew into uh, an industry that really embraces the full cycle of water, which we believe is uh, something very unique for Milwaukee. We have companies that are taking the water out, using the water, cleaning the water, uh, recleaning it, and putting it back, very much in this full cycle of water. About six or seven years ago, as we were going through a regional economic development effort, we came to discover this water technology industry. And I say discovery because it is not typical uh, in business strategies. There is no business code for water technology. So for instance, a water meter company is in the measurement business. A A.O. Smith, who makes water heaters, is consumer products. 
And I liken it to the fact that what we did is we turned the picture a little bit, gave it a 90 degree twist, and saw an entirely new picture of an economy that we had grown. We initially thought there were 50 companies all focused on water technology, and we now have learned that we've got over 150 and continuing to grow more of those companies. And when I talk about our water technology companies, I'm doing a very, very strict uh, characterization of that. These are companies that are the suppliers that are addressing quality and quantity issues. But it's not just the industry, it's the academic programs that we have with going on. So the Great Lakes Water Institute had started about um, 40 years ago, again, with the Clean Water Act coming into play. Part of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee grew to become the largest freshwater research operation in the Great Lakes and now has become the only school of freshwater sciences. So oftentimes we talk about the Silicon Valley of water and it is the connection between industry and academia being able to work together. Our three focus are dealing with economic development, talent development, and technology development. These are some of the companies that uh, call Milwaukee home. We have, fought, in fact, I gotta change the Siemens uh, name because that's now become Evoqua. Um, we have five of the 11 largest in the world. These are our academic partners, uh, most notably the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee and their School of Freshwater Sciences, but we've got programs that are dealing with pharmaceuticals and water. University of Wisconsin Whitewater, you can actually now get a business degree with a water emphasis so that you learn the science around water, but you may be an accountant or a marketing professional. Most notably is the fact that in September we opened the Global Water Center. This is a 98,000 square foot building. It used to be an old warehouse that we have converted it into water technology business and accelerator. Very unique facility principally because of the fact it works in one vertical being water. And within this, you have major international businesses that have operations in this facility, both A.O. Smith, Veolia, Badger Meter, Grunfoss Pumps, Sloan Valve, that have these operations, but also combined with medium-sized businesses and the entire top floor of the university or has been taken by the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee labs up there, moving to, towards commercialization. And then lastly is what we have is an entrepreneur program, which we have now just named The Brew, and uh, named for business research uh, entrepreneurs in Wisconsin. And to be able to take what we had a year ago with one company in terms of a startup entrepreneur to now we have 12 and next year we'll add another 10. So in a matter of a couple years, we go from one to probably 25 different entrepreneurs that are working in this space. This is just some pictures of the interior. It's a gorgeous space. One of the most important areas is on the right there. That's the cafe. That's where the coffee is brewed. And truthfully, that's where actually all of the connections are being made as well. An auditorium. Uh, A.O. Smith's research facility testing water meters that are water filters that are applied uh, in uh, China. And lab space up on the 10th or 7th floor. And most notably then also we are building out a total water technology park across the street from us. It's an 18 acre area that is devoted to bringing in water technology companies and we'll be probably announcing in the two, next two months the first relocation of that, but we're using this as a show place on water management with the fact we don't want any water to go into the canal nor into the sewage system, so it's been totally redone, and actually the design is to create a, our own micro water, wastewater and energy utility on site to be able to handle and create water and energy at that space. This is some of the designs for that as well. Five minutes away, the School of Fresh Water Sciences is doing an expansion that's occurring to its facilities. That's where all the basic water research. So what we are developing is a large urban area all devoted to water technology. And that's it. Fast. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Got a lot of questions for you in a minute. Um, so now you get a, a hint of what we want today to be about. 
it, it, we need to do what they're doing. <laughs> and we are in a lot of ways. Uh, we have a lot of areas of focus, and we're going to talk about that uh, in just a minute. I uh, want to bring up our next speaker. One of the things uh, you need to know about what's happening in New Orleans is that every two years, the Water Environment Federation holds their conference here. And WEFTEC is a gathering of 25,000 water quality engineers, experts, and professionals from around the world who don't just come here to do a convention, but come here to do good. And one of the reasons it runs that way is because of people like our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Barry Liner also holds multiple degrees, and he's a multiple threat. Uh, he really understands all of the aspects of what we're trying to do with our water, with our businesses, with the fabric of our society that interacts with this. And we're really grateful to have him here today. Uh, he really does fulfill WEF's mission, which is to provide bold leadership, champion innovation, connect water professionals, and leverage knowledge to support clean and safe water worldwide. It's a beautiful mission. It's actually the kind of mission that everybody can swear to. And that's the best kind of mission. So I'll, I'll quit talking about him and let Barry come tell us some more about all this stuff. And then we're going to have a conversation. This is Dr. Barry Liner. Thanks a lot, Steve. Um, I'm, I'm very honored to be here and represent WEF uh, here. Like, uh, like Steve said, we, we come every two years. Um, We'll be here in September, and we will bring probably between 18 and 25,000 people. Uh, this is the largest water quality event in the world. And um, as, because we're coming back every two years, we really want to develop a partnership with New Orleans and Louisiana and the region. And we're going to be uh, offering a lot of uh, additional programming this year, additional opportunities for your local, um, your local organizations. So I've been leaning very heavily on uh, Stephen Grasshopper to help coordinate that. But what I want to, I'm going to come at this a little differently than Dean. We're going to meet in the same place, but I'm going to come at this from the environmental side. And then as we move to the entrepreneurship and what, um, and startup companies uh, on, on the economic development side. So this picture right here, this is what we're faced with with some of our infrastructure. Okay. This is, uh, this is called um, struvite. It's, it's clogging a pipe at a, at a treatment plant right now. And what that is is um, magnesium ammonium phosphate. So any of you who know anything about fertilizers would know that uh, that's nitrogen and phosphorus. There's companies that have figured out, hey, instead of letting that stuff build up on our pipes, let's pull it out earlier, and then we can actually turn that into a saleable product. So Astara is one of the leaders, and they take the struvite, and they make this product um, crystal green, and they actually sell it as a high-end fertilizer. Multiform Harvest is another group that does the exact same thing. So these are companies that are taking problems, turning them into solutions, and making money off them. And this uh, laser pointer, this, this little guy right there, that's actually uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Um, so there's, there's star power, if you will, behind these kind of efforts. He's a shareholder in Astara, and this was from their launch of um, the world's largest struvite recovery, which is the, the ph phosphorus, that fertilizer, the world's largest struvite recovery facility, which is being constructed uh, in Chicago. So when I talk about what's new in water, there's, water's very broad, but I'm going to cover three areas in general, and then, we'll, then I'll hit some other things area. But nutrients, energy, and water are very interrelated with what we're looking at. And we're not just noticing um, that from an environmental standpoint. And in fact, we're, the Water Environment Federation no longer calls wastewater treatment plants wastewater treatment plants. They're water resource recovery facilities. We want to flip that mindset. It's not, it's that whole water cycle that Dean put up before. It's a resource, it's, there's not waste. Everything we have is a resource. And you can see this is a, this is True North Venture Partners is a, uh, is a niche venture capital firm that focuses on water. Um, and they actually are talking about that their companies recognize water resources as resources and, and, not, as, and not as waste. XPV, located out of Toronto, 
is another niche venture capital firm. Their portfolio has eight different companies in the water space, and they're interested in, they're not in the, interested in this typical VC quick money and turn, turn it over relatively fast. They're interested in, in longer term investments. So there's a lot of activity out there in the water space. Imagine H2O is a um, accelerator, a virtual accelerator out of San Francisco. They run a program, they, uh, a competition every year. And their last, their rec most recent competition was on um, agriculture water. And they announced their winners um, last Tuesday, actually. Uh, but we've been working with them for, for uh, four years now with all of their programs. I see the previous programs up there on wastewater, water efficiency, consumer innovations. Um, they're an accelerator. They're, uh, they're a, a network. They uh, are partners with um, Dean's Group at the, at, the Milwaukee, at the Water Council. So Dean's Group, we talk, and Steve mentioned water clusters, water innovation clusters. Dean's Group's up there with the, uh, the, Milwaukee, the Water Council. These are, the, these are groups that are recognizing that water is a, is a critical issue and, and something you can do ec build economic development around. These are this, a ton of groups out there. That's all, because, um, because this is a relatively new phenomenon, a lot of these are just startups and are just, some of them are just research houses, some of them are, okay, some of them are focusing on, um, uh, they're not really focusing on the economic development as, as mature as the Milwaukee Water Council, uh, Blue Tech Valley, which focuses on agriculture water, uh, Confluence, which really focuses on the, um, uh, the Ohio River Basin. Um, and the, so we have right here, New Orleans, the Idea Village there. There's a potential, <laughs> yes. There's a potential here to really build build on there, and I, we really hope to help support that. So I'll go through the real, real quickly. So um, Dean mentioned the brew. I was a judge last year on the brew uh, when it was the um, Global Freshwater Seed Accelerator. I like the brew much better. Um, one of the winners that came out of that was Vegetal ID, which is a French company that makes uh, modular green roofs for stormwater retention. So because of that, their program, this French group located in Milwaukee instead of anywhere else in the U.S. for their U.S. operations. So this shows the advantages that, of a coordinated approach. Uh, the Idea Village, like again, I'm, this is a great opportunity for this region to really move forward. And I, I just want to note that the finalists from today's competition and the last four winners, we will feature at WEFTEC, complimentary to them, uh, and we're working with Steve and, and, and Grasshopper to work that out. So we really look forward to, to, to doing that this year. Thank you. So, so one of the ways we do that is at our show, you know, if you've been to a, one of the large conventions here, you see you can get lost if you're a small firm. So we carve out a special area called our Innovation Pavilion, and we uh, focus only startups in there. They have to win a prize. Uh, uh, through Imagine H2O, Blue Tech Research, or, or through this program um, to get in here. And they, but we highlight them and bring a spotlight on them that they wouldn't have otherwise, and they'd be lost next to the Badger Meters and the Veolias and the other people that, that Dean was talking about before. So here's a couple of uh, winners that have been shown there before. What these groups do is this one uh, right here, they take carbon dioxide and inject it into wastewater and they make basically ceramics. So they're taking waste, turning it into something. This, these people are recovering heavy metals. Um, Pave drain is a, uh, is a recent winner from this year. What these guys do is they take uh, this pervious pavement, but instead of doing the uh, block by hand, they figured out a unique way to basically string a, a cable through it and then you can lay that a lot easier and a lot quicker out in the field. They actually are taking the next step, they're actually putting a, hot, uh, putting a solar panel and putting a, a heater wire through so they actually, you can actually melt the snow and ice. Not that that's an issue here too much, although it was this year. Um, so nutrients, 
um, in, the, in water. A lot of the stuff we, we see uh, recover from biosolids um, out of wastewater solids can be used as fertilizer. There's problems with that with regulations um, and, and some of the, the entrepreneurs and the startups are facing with this trying to move forward. Um, you know, regula regulatory environment is very, is very difficult. Uh, energy is a huge one, huge issue there. This is an anaerobic digester which takes waste, generates biogas, and this is East Bay Municipal Utility District. They're a utility, a water and wastewater utility, that actually now has energy in there because they're a net energy producer. And here's them getting their, their congressional record uh, statement. They're the first in the US that actually is a net energy producer. Another example of a startup company, okay, look at this, this is clogged pipes right here. This is fat soils and greases. That's a problem, that's a, a waste that we're dealing with. A startup company called Fogbusters takes this and converts it over into diesel. This company Core is another, and by the way, I don't have stock in any of these companies. I'm not pitching any of them. Just want to be clear with that. But this, what they do is they take uh, solids and they create uh, renewable diesel or aviation fuel out of that. That's not the only way to get energy. Lucid Energy is a startup that actually has um, inline hydro where they're actually getting the, from using gravity to, to take the water and recover energy that way. So one other thing, so after we do this biogas, okay, we still have some of it left over and we're flaring it. The first thing, we should be embarrassed of that as a, as a country that we're wasting renewable natural gas. Um, but there's a lot of regulatory barriers in there and that's what we really need to address. Technology is relatively easy. The barriers are, are, the regulatory barriers are tough. But there's a company that actually took that and then realized, you know what, we have to do disinfection of our wastewater and chlorine's bad, bad stuff, right? So let's take two wastes and put them together and you know what, we'll win an award. And this pasteurization technology group is using this excess heat from the, there and they are pasteurizing water and heating it up to 180 degrees so now you don't have to use chlorine, okay? The really cool thing about this innovation is there's nothing innovative about it. It's a, it's a heat exchanger that's been around for hundreds of years, right? Piece of cake kind of stuff, but it's a great opportunity to turn this into, uh, turn a, a negative into a positive. Um, real quickly, the Imagine H2O finalists. Now, well, I've talked a lot about water, wastewater kind of things here, but there's a lot of areas of water, okay? Around here, you've got coastal issues, coastal restoration, groundwater, all kinds of things. These are the finalists from the Imagine H2O competition this year. This is the, oops, sorry, not the Dean, Terra Avion. <laughs> um, was the winner of the early stage track. What they do is they have a little drone that flies around agricultural fields and they get the soil moisture content so you know how to better irrigate your crops. The uh, CSS was the, um, was the growth stage track. What they do is that's the California safe soil. They go out and they collect food waste and so it doesn't get disposed of in the um, uh, in landfills, and they actually recover that and turn it into another resource. So not all the innovation is coming from small companies. Some of them is coming from large companies. This is from GE. Their latest membranes can recycle water at 20% less, 30% um, uh, uh, less energy usage as before. And the thing is, while we're focusing on these small startups, and why would I bring in this GE thing? Well, also the ZWE, where they came from, was a small company called Xenon, which grew up and GE bought. So we're actually hopeful that every one of the companies that we see come up and are, become like this. Um, real, and in closing, like Steve said, we come here every two years. We have a service project every year. We're also focusing, this is what our, our conference looks like, our conference flo show floor looks like, and we carve out a pavilion for the, the winners. And we'll be back here in, in September and looking forward to putting the people that you see this afternoon and the previous three or four winners up there and highlighting that, plus other things that we'll be happy to announce through Stephen Grasshopper over the next few months about um, our, our partnership with New Orleans and Louisiana. Thank you very much for your time.
I wasn't exaggerating. I, if anything, I undersold both of these gentlemen today to you. Um, it, it's, it's hard to know where to begin when you see such uh, inspiring stuff and so much new technology and so many things. And one of the, the challenges we're facing around here is, you know, we like to, you've probably heard the phrase, drinking from a fire hose or drowning in opportunities. Uh, we have so many things that we're doing here. Dean, when, when the Water Council coalesced, was there, and I know you, you, you said the brewing industry was a key industry, but was there, was it one person who said, who started this spark, or was there, like with the Idea Village, a few people had gathered in a bar and wrote on a napkin? How did it, how did it really get started? Because that's an important, uh, important thing to know. Well, we got started, as I said earlier, there was a regional economic development effort that was going on, so an assessment of that. And frankly, when we looked at that, there was probably about 20,000 jobs that we estimated was in the water tech industry in our area. Small compared to other industries. And so myself and the person who was with the Greater Milwaukee Committee said, we'll take this on and see if we could develop it. The, the good fortune was that there were two CEOs that actually came to their own discovery. Uh, one is the CEO of Badger Meter, the other was A.O. Smith Corporation, totally separate, came to their own discovery, the fact that they were 10 minutes apart from each other and didn't realize that each had research facilities that could support each other. The, the good fortune was that those two CEOs went to the person from the Greater Milwaukee Committee and came up with the same discovery that we had. But the, the thing that happened was instead of going and competing in our efforts, we actually combined our efforts and really coalesced around that. And so that we were able to put together a lot of volunteers uh, for the first couple of years, a lot of private sector support, and I should say, this was driven by the private sector. Government was supportive, but they followed, and they followed when they needed to, and they provided the financial support when it was needed. But we could not have been able to accomplish this without the private sector, and certainly to have two CEOs that were committed to doing this. That's, that's a really important dynamic. And I, I don't want to give away the whole day, but so much of what you both presented today is what this entire day is going to be about, example after example of exactly that kind of stuff, because we have the United States uh, Business Council for Sustainable Development, which specializes in bringing together companies who are often unaware that one company's waste is another company's inputs. And Coca-Cola is here to share their story about resource efficiency and the recognition of all these synergies. So you all have to stay here all day. I hope you realize that. Are you going to miss something important? This is just the beginning of the discussion. Barry, you've watched this kind of stuff happen all over the country. And uh, I mean, I think Milwaukee has a very special situation in that they had two strong leaders in a core industry. We have so many industries here that are very powerful and, and, and core to who we are in Louisiana. And they use water, but they're not necessarily water companies. Do you see any links here? I mean, you have such a rich academic mind, and, and you've, you've studied economics, you've studied business management, you're an engineer, you're a systems thinker. Uh, you heard Dean say when he tried to look at classifications for water jobs, and, and, and Grasshopper and I have gone through this in trying to develop an, an entrepreneurial ecosystem map, when you go to try and look for these categories and these things, you almost have to create some new ones because water is so spread out. Do, do you see something that we can do that's different? Well, one of the, one of the key things that um, when I showed that, that graphic of all the water clusters, the ones that have been successful, and, and granted it's relatively new, um, you've been around, what, four years? Right. And they're the mature sector, <laughs> they're the mature council. But imagine what they've done in four years with that building and all the, I've actually toured that building and it, it's phenomenal up there. But the ones, what we see is that people that have a mission around a theme do better instead of, because water is so broad, it's so difficult to, to coordinate all of that. Blue Tech Valley out in California, agricultural water, that's their focus, okay? 
manufacturing in, and the academia and, and the research in fresh water in Milwaukee. That's their focus. Water Tap Ontario up, up and on, is about development of local uh, of water treatment technologies up in, in Ontario. They've got a little bit of a theme there. Confluence in Cincinnati is focused on the Ohio River I issues and coordinating three states there. The, all the other ones, they're thinking water's a great thing, let's do something, but they're trying to find their way. So I think finding a theme is a key thing. I think Arizona Southwest is gonna be pretty good because they're all about the water resources and droughts and the water availability. That's gonna be their one theme there. So having something that you can really focus on is gonna be the key thing for, for New Orleans to go forward. And that's really hard for us because we have right. so many thematic elements here. Uh, we, we tried to map out all the, the major industries built around water here and, and we counted seven, I believe, including maritime, mm -hmm. uh, which when we go to restore our coast, we have to have transportation people at the table or else they can't float their boats. You know, so some of our projects to, to do restoration by diverting the river and stuff impacts maritime. And so we, we have so many layers mm -hmm. uh, coalescing. I mean, we see opportunity every right. turn. What we struggle with is coordination right. and, and putting the onus on an entity or a leader or, or a system that should lead this. And, and I, I agree. I think the economic development side is so critical here uh, to, to the whole mix. Um, do you have some 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 scary stories to tell us? I mean, this is all beautiful, but I know that nothing is ever as easy as it seems. Were there some particularly difficult challenges in getting these, this coordination and coalescing together? I mean, obviously funding is always the big thing for everybody. How did you find a, a stable enough resource and get everybody to agree with you to do this? It's always about funding, yes. and um, that is, you know, the $600 pound gorilla that's out there that you always have to deal with. Um, we were fortunate, and I, I want to build up on, I'm going to come back to this, but okay. the uniqueness, uh, to reinforce what Barry said, is you have to play to your strengths and make it very genuine to what you are. Uh, our co-chair, the head of Badger Meter, says, you know, listen, Milwaukee is not going to be the country western music capital of the world. We don't do country western music at all. That's Nashville. What we do is water, and we know how to move it, and we know how to clean it, and how to address that. And so you have to really play to that very unique strength, and then to be, be able to build off of that. In terms of that scary moments, um, the biggest one was going forward on this development of the Global Water Center. And believe me, it was a $22 million project that for an organization that had been a, a year in existence, a nonprofit organization, what bank is going to give us money for this project? This is, by, mind you, also during the Great Recession. And so there was a, a lot of sleepless nights with that. I mean, we were fortunate to be able to have and find some private investors to be able to make this all possible. And I don't want to sort of oversimplify, but it is if you build it, they will come, and they are coming in droves for us. Uh, I talked about the entrepreneurs. We've got four French companies that are in the building. Uh, we're getting interest from Germany, Israel, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, there is a really good partnership that exists there. Um, but it is, comes down to the funding, and we still are an entrepreneur organization. We operate that way. Some of our entrepreneurs are even older in terms of existence than we are. So that's the one that keeps us always up at night. And, and frankly, also the ones that are the scariest moments are leadership from the Water Council and our companies, who's buying who out, and uh, with a buyout, do you lose a particular leader? I think we've now established ourselves strong enough that we'll be able to maintain that effort, but that was some of the scary things. And that's an ongoing, so it's, it's an ongoing battle then just to keep all these things going. 
I know it's, uh, WEF is a membership organization, but surely there's more, go more to it than just that. Is it, is it totally run on the membership dues, or do you all do other developmental work in order to be able to do the amount of outreach you do to help communities like New Orleans and like Milwaukee, and, and everybody wants y'all to help, Barry. I mean, uh, y'all have really become the Lone Ranger in some ways uh, uh, that people love to see riding over the hill coming in their direction. Well, basically, most of our, our revenue comes from our conference. Mm -hmm. um, it's, like I said, it's the largest in the annual conference in the world on, on water quality, so that's where it comes from. Um, so we, what we want to do is prop that up and help drive innovation because, if, like I mentioned, if we, if we get these startups to get really successful, then they come and they buy booths from us and they you know, increase our revenue. They become members, and you know, that's where we're looking at. Um, but I want to touch on some of the, the scary point kind of things. So we're, we're focused on trying to get innovation in the, in the water sector. And there's two real problems that we, we're really facing. And the first one is, a lot of these, a lot of these startups, um, you know, they have a better mousetrap, but do, do, do the customers have mice? You know, got, it's got to be customer based. We have to focus on the customer base. Um, so you'll see a lot of the startups that they'll take off, and then they won't go anywhere because they got a great product, but it's not the right and the right need. The other time, the other thing is the regulations and the the legal and regulatory impediments to for some of these technologies to take off. One of the earlier winners from um, Imagine H2O is a company called Hydrovolts. Mm -hmm. They were spectacular, had a, a, a floating turbine that would go in, in a river and just take and generate electricity. But because of the various laws, the only way place they could put them is in concrete channels because if it had natural stream banks, they couldn't, um, they couldn't tether it with wires to the stream bank, so they were limited to just this area. So that made it difficult for them to, um, to succeed, even though they had a better mousetrap. And right now they're reorganizing for the second time. So they're still trying, but it's rather difficult. One thing I've noticed is that uh you know, going back into the 90s with, with, the, with Kenrod and Israel, really doing global outreach to find the entrepreneurs and bring them to Israel and, and nurture them and then invest in them. We're all looking at this accelerator model. We're all looking at this entrepreneurial model. It, it seems ubiquitous amongst all the water clusters that I've looked at. I don't know that literally every one of them has it built in, but it seems more and more that way. Um, ours is focused strictly local, which I've noticed most of the ones I've seen out there are casting a wide net, uh, which there's a couple of things that concern me there about, you know, shaking the tree, the same tree all the time. You're not going to always get ripe fruit every time you shake the tree. It depends on when you do it. But also uh, uh, the competition, is this, could this get to a point where, where these accelerators and these clusters are actually just competing to get the entrepreneurs into the thing? Because that's, a, that's an interesting dynamic here because it, is, it has become rather ubiquitous. Yes, um, <laughs> pure and simple. Um, I think that there is a, a level of development towards that competition aspect. I mean, the water sector is not that large. I mean, it's not as huge as, you say, medical instruments or, God forbid, we need another app for something. Um, so there is a limited, you know, we looked at within Milwaukee, we had you know, three or four companies, startups that were in our geographic area. We knew that we had to attract from elsewhere, and so we started bringing in others. The, the first year, we, we brought in five companies, uh, and they actually have space in our global water center. They get low-cost rent. They get each $50,000 cash to do with as they wish. Um, but the most important thing is the mentorship that they value a lot. Um, I don't know how much the U.S. market, I think that there are certain areas, but if there were to be 20 accelerators, I don't know if there's that much of a, a market that's out there for that many at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a concern. You know, we, we've seen it in four years of, of that the hardest part of this program is, is not finding the entrepreneurs, but reaching the entrepreneurs so that they are aware of the program. And we're, we're fortunate that we 
the net we cast is, is regional and it makes it rel relatively easy for us, but I do, I do get concerned that this could get a little competitive out there at a certain level, at least globally. So as we look at the vision we have for trying to expand this program, we're gonna have to find that our strengths and, uh, and focus on the things that we can do well over here. Um, have y'all seen any success in trying to move this model into the school systems, into cultivating the culture of innovation at the earliest possible age, because these, as you said, these are these are existential issues we're dealing with here. Uh, the solutions might not come from the people who've been making a lot of the problems. It might come from somebody who's got a fresh perspective and, and is looking at their own future. Uh, do you, are y'all doing it? And Barry, do y'all work on these issues with WEF as well? Well, they, um, some of the the innovative uh, utilities generally do have outreach to the to the schools. But that's, they're already the innovative utilities. The, the ones that are a little bit less innovative aren't out there nearly as much. They want to stay b below the radar. Um, but I'd like to come back to that, the, the, the innovation, uh, the, the com competition between the potential clusters and, and the oversaturation, I guess, of uh, accelerators. Um, again, focusing on the, we need to focus on the customers. And, um, we have a global deficit in infrastructure, I just read on a flight out here, of a trillion dollars a year. We spend 2.7 trillion globally on infrastructure, about 40% of that's water, and we should be send, spending 3.7 trillion. In America, we are hundreds of, like $400 billion uh, in, of asset needs. Um, so there will be market sometime but the biggest problem with innovation in the water sector is everything we do um, is hard assets whether it's um, whether it's coastal work out there whether it's pipe in the ground whether it's treatment plant so innovation is it's like a fruit fly and the elephant okay the fruit fly turns over all the time you know the, lots of generations really quickly that's what your phone's like we're an elephant in the infrastructure area. It's a long time for us to, to, to switch out our infrastructure. So the innovation takes a little longer to, to do. And so there will be a market. It's how much of, how many different players can we actually have in that? Yeah, and, and uh, to reinforce that, I mean, the industry is not something early adapters or adopters at all. And so it takes a long time, and I think that's one of my also fears for some of these entrepreneurs who have a great idea, but there's not necessarily a desire or a demand by utilities necessarily, and then you know, their interest fades and they go off to something else. So that's a, a fear. We do do education. We're actually working in <coughs> elementary schools. We've got an education task force that brings together teachers um, we go from graduate all the way down into the elementary level with the real belief is that, you know, a 10-year-old or I'll say 11-year-old in, in 10 years, which will go by really quickly, can actually influence a lot when they become 21. So we have the real belief that you've got to start very, very young on getting an awareness about water as, a, as an issue and as well as an opportunity. And that's a big area for us here too as well. Our academic resources dedicated to uh, research and to developing sustainable technologies for our, for our coast and our lifestyles here and as you all know with the Water Institute of the Gulf and Tulane Riverfront Campus we have some pretty bold plans that are very similar uh, to, Mil to Milwaukee's in having a water campus. Um, a lot of these programs right now are they know how far they can go within their budgets uh, for this year and for next year. How hard is it for you up in Wisconsin, and Barry, where you're as an academic yourself, do you see, and the role of academia, we all agreed when we had a conversation last night, academia and government have enormous roles to play in this thing, but we're living in an era of defunding, de of disinvestment in academia at the government level, and disinvestment in government in a lot of ways. How do we have the network and the fabric and all these elements work together? Because it seems to me, Dean, in particular in your case, the coalescing of academic resources is really creating a momentum that's causing investment. 
Um, are, are, are there some keys that, are, are there some things we can say or do that help the state of Louisiana reinvest back into academia and, and really recognize that this is key to our economic future as well? Right. It, we talk about our cluster in the fullness of industry, academia, government, NGOs. So we do not separate that at all, and, and I think that that's an important aspect, so that then what you do is you have industry really supporting higher education, because we really have a belief that if the private sector gets behind the expansion which is occurring at the School of Freshwater Sciences to be able to train the talent, they can talk to you know, folks at our state capital and say this is a priority. Uh, at the same time, academic programs are, you know, certainly supportive of industry as well, because they're looking for, you know, to be able to hire those graduates. So it really becomes seamless. And so from an industry or a, from a cluster standpoint, we are talking with academics on a daily basis. Um, and in many ways, we don't even recognize who gets paid by who because we're all working collectively together as one uniform cluster. Yeah. And what do you think, um, one thing with the, the academics is the same kind of thing as we talk about the entrepreneurs and making sure that whatever product you're making has a customer. If academics are training people in, in a way that people aren't willing to hire them or they're not doing the research that's, that the companies want, that a customer wants, they're not going to do a very good job. That's why the, the, the relationship up in Milwaukee, for example, is a great, great relationship showing that you know, the, the academic programs are tailored to what the, what the clients, what the, what the employers, what the um, people who are doing the research and want to sell and, and commercialize want. Well, we've got just a few minutes left, and I, what I'd like to do at this point is give you all both a chance to give us some final thoughts, because I know we've had such incredible conversations starting last night and again today, and, and I, I hope you all are really listening carefully to these people. Uh, do you have some final thoughts that maybe we haven't covered or some key, some key points either one of you would like to make, or, or am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so uh, I'll let Dean think for a second. Uh, but one of the things uh, I really urge um, the, this, this region to um, come together. Uh, uh, there, a lot of wonderful things is hap are happening. Um, and we really want to highlight this at WEFTEC. Being, this is kind of self-serving, but I, I want to get the winners from today, the finalists from today, the Horizon Institute, the Louisiana Sturmwater Coalition, the, the, water, the uh, water Synergy Program. Uh, we want to highlight that at WEFTEC to all the, to the 20,000 people that come in. We want to raise the profile here. So we're really looking forward to, to working with you. Um, so I hope as, as your effort matures, we will uh, will be able to to work with you. So, and we're we're pulling for you and doing everything we possibly can to, to help support it. And then so we some. And we I really <laughs> appreciate the opportunity to come down here and talk to you guys. And I'm really looking forward to judging this afternoon. Yes, Barry's going to be one of our judges today too. So just be on alert, everybody. Dean, you got some thoughts? Well, I also I want to. You, you want to give us any more keys, sure. or you want to hold back? But a I also want to. I want to thank Barry and Wef yeah. uh, because. Uh, we have been working with them for over a year now, and when he talks about the advantage of working in WEFTEC, um, we had six or so of our entrepreneurs that were participating in Chicago last year. Very, very beneficial. I know that we're going to be participating again in New Orleans as well. And to be able to have that model where I cannot reinforce enough, those small little companies get lost in those big, huge companies. So to be able to put together that innovation showcase and they're all on the same level is really helpful. So I encourage uh, for your entrepreneurs to really partake in that opportunity significantly. The other thing that I would say in terms of, you know, just focus, focus, focus. There are so many efforts that are going in many different directions and it really just drains the energy we look at what's going on in Milwaukee. Fortunately, we are the only water effort in Milwaukee. I look at other accelerators that are going on. These are just general tech uh, accelerators. 
And they're all after the same type of thing. And so then they end up starting to compete with each other, again, at that local level. And it just drains the energy. And if you could pull that coordination together, you can do so much more and to be able to move ahead. And, and again, whether it's for you as an economic development effort, if it's an environmental, determine what that is and then move forward with that. That's great. I, I, I think that's great advice. It's a challenge for us because, as you know, you know this is an, yet another addition to all the things that we do here. You know, you know, Tim Williamson describes New Orleans Entrepreneur Week as the Mardi Gras of entrepreneurial events, and it, it's only going to get bigger. And, uh, and of course, the next we have French Quarter Fest, then we have Jazz Fest, then we have, you know, it's on and on and on down here. So for us to stay focused is very difficult. So I hope you recognize that, and, and we, we, we would invite you all to come back down here and find out why and spend some more time. You all don't really know this, but these guys really came in just for today. They are busy. They're going up to a cluster meeting in Cincinnati uh, that EPA is, is uh, launching tonight and into tomorrow. And we're really, really grateful. They, they came and shared their wisdom with us and, and shared all this with us. We can't thank you enough. Barry, we're going to be working with you. Your phone's going to be ringing a lot. Dean, we want to stay in touch and, uh, and, and get you to come back down here sometime. Thank Can we give them a big round of applause, please? Thank you.